Uh, so we're going to kind of continue to talk about his character uh, tonight, and we're going to uh, do that again next week. Uh, and I guess just as one more announcement, the following, not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after, we will not be here. We will be with our entire church for Ash Wednesday. Uh, so we'll be with the adults kind of participating in that. And that's going to kick off our next series uh, coming up with Ashes of Fire. So uh, just be ready for that in, uh, next Wednesday. So if you're anything like me, you guys probably have a lot of people in charge of you. You might not like to have people in charge of you, but I was just thinking about this off the top of my head. You know, I have, uh, you know, I have my boss, that pastor, O'Shea, is in, in charge of me. I can't just go rogue and do whatever I want. Uh, I have to kind of, you know, pick his brain and, and make sure what I do is okay. So he's in charge of me. I have uh, kind of my parents. You know, I'm an adult and I'm married and I live in my own house. But I, but I also, the house that I live in is theirs. And so I mostly don't care what they think. But at the same time, I can't really just do whatever I want because then they can kick me out of their house and that would be. So they're kind of in charge of me. You know, I have professors at school. They're in charge of me, and they do things. They tell me, you know, what deadlines to take and, and how to do stuff. And if I don't do it exactly right, or if I don't, um, you know, if, if spacing isn't right and stuff, they hammer me and take all my toys away. I get upset. Uh, so they're in charge of me. You, have, you know, go obviously government officials, the police are in charge. You know, the president of the United States, Barack Obama, I guess technically charge of me. So my question to you guys is, as we kind of unwrap this, is if you could be in charge of everything, what would you change? All right? So I'm looking for some hands. I'm looking for some answers. And I'll say this. Let's just get the church answer out of the way. Obviously we would end, you know, world hunger and we would, uh, you know, everyone would love Jesus. Uh, but I'm more looking, let's just lighten up the mood. Like, what would you change? Little things that are maybe a little bit funny. What would you change? <laughs> so peace. So just what I said, we would already, okay. <laughs> Good. Talk about delivery. Talk about delivery. Okay. Very cool. All right. You got some shout outs for that. Go out. Girls could be in the NFL. Yeah. Oh, okay. I suppose you can. I thought they can already. They I think you can. can. <laughs> so, so you mean like not allowed? You mean like girls would actually like not that they would be allowed to, but they would actually be good enough to. Like girls would just be better at sports. Is that what that mean? Sorry, girls. I got, take, I got, I got too many girls in front. I'm gonna kick. Yeah. Lower the age for driving. That's it. Oh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Ah, uh, so so advertising would be actually real. You couldn't advertise fake paint. Okay, that's good. You can get like, like you can get like books and stuff like at the house if you look at the I want like, my table and I can do it. Alright, so you need that maybe some tech technology some stuff. Alright, what else? Come on, people. Yeah, Not just at 10 o'clock and later, but all the time, half off, half off. Yeah. We're thinking big now. We're thinking. We're like, let's use our, yeah, let's use our authority for uh, major, major issues. He needs to get some DVR. Skip those commercials. They already have that. <laughs>
about this, we actually, uh, the only reason I was thinking about this, well, actually has a lot to do with the message, but I was also thinking about this question because uh, there was a Super Bowl. Last year at the Super Bowl, I was at Julie's family's house, and we, for, I don't know how the question got brought up, but we started asking people, and they were, you know, I think what I said is uh, you wouldn't be allowed to work on Sundays, just because I think we're, uh, so many people, we're such a go, go, go society, and I think it would be awesome to have nothing open, but we're about to live like this. But we asked, we, and this is really sad, we asked, um, how, how was there, nine? A nine, a nine year old, and we said, we said, Alex, you know, if you could do anything, want, what would you do? And he was like, I would lower the drinking age. And I was like, oh. I was like, uh, this got really awkward. And I was like, why? He's like, so we could get partied up. And I was like, it was really, it was really sad. Like I was, I was like looking around, like, did anyone just, he was like, this is the problem. This is not good. I don't want to be like that pastor guy, but I think anyone would agree that that wasn't a good uh, thing to say. And so tonight I want to talk about how I want to talk about how God is in charge. Right? That's kind of what we're going to be talking about, God's character. And the technical term for that is God's sovereignty. God is sovereign. That's kind of part of his character. And so we're going to talk about that tonight. I want to define this word sovereign for you as we get into it. So if you're taking notes, you can write it down like this. Sovereign means having supreme rank, power, or authority. Supreme, preeminent, indisputable. Greatest in degree, utmost or extreme, being above all others in character, importance, and excellence. I mean, that's just a pretty sweet adjective. I mean, if, I mean that's, that says it all. I mean, if you, you want to describe someone as awesome, you're sovereign. I mean, it's just this word that kind of incorporates everything about who God is, but really his in chargedness is depicted in that word sovereign. And so this sounds really good, you know, to say that God is sovereign and God is in charge. But I want you guys to think, how would you explain this to maybe a non-believer? How would you explain this to maybe an atheist, someone who didn't believe in God, or especially someone who went through a really tough time? Maybe, you know, there was a death in the family or something of that nature. It would be pretty hard to explain to that one, uh, to that person, yeah, yeah, I know this happened, but God's in charge. It's okay. They, they're not going to be okay with that. I, I went on Yahoo and I just looked at the world news just to look at what's going on uh, in our world and uh, kind of got some headlines for you. Uh, there's a Missouri teen gets life with, uh, with possible parole in killing. And I don't know if anyone read that story. Uh, I always go on Yahoo and that's where I get my news. Uh, it almost made me throw up to read the story about this girl who had, was murdering uh, other children just for the fun of it. Uh, it's, it's very sickening. I, I, was, I, I, I couldn't get, even bring myself to read the article. Uh, I started to, and it was, it was that messed up. Scores killed in shelling of Syrian city in, uh, of Homs. Uh, Iran says it can hit U.S. interests worldwide if attacked. Global warming, uh, like weather on steroids. And I don't know about you guys, but <coughs> this is what global warming is like. I say we warm it on up because it's been pretty nice this week. You know, we get out the nuclear power plants and all that. But, it's kind of scary, kind of uncertain, uh, kind of uncertainty going on. Uh, Philippines earthquake buries residents and bloodshed mounts in Syria. And reading things like that can sometimes tend us to go doubt God's uh, sovereignty, sovereignty and kind of doubt that he's truly um, in charge. And things like that really kind of get at us. And it's, it's kind of tough to explain. And so... I want to ensure you tonight that, yes, despite all those things, God is sovereign. He is supreme. He is in charge. And I want to talk about two different things, or two ideas that come from God's sovereignty. Two things that you guys can take away with that I want you to understand about who God is uh, tonight. All right? And so the first thing is, despite what goes on in your life, despite what circumstances you uh, encounter, uh, what hand you've been dealt God is truly in charge. You can write that down. God is in charge. God is in control. Whatever you read in the papers, all these things that are negativity all the time, God is still in control. I want to read to you guys a passage, and we're going to break it down. Uh, as you guys have your Bibles out, uh, I want you to go to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2. Okay, some water. <laughs> 
Awesome. All right. First Samuel chapter two, verse two through ten. I'm gonna go ahead and read it, and then we'll we'll break it down. So I'm in Isaiah here. All right, here we go. First Samuel chapter two, verse two through ten. It's a little bit long. Stay with me here. It says. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by Him, de- uh, for the Lord is a God who knows, and by Him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who are f- full hire themselves out for food, but those who are hungry hunger no more. She who is barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down, uh, he brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. Upon them he has set the world. He will guard uh, the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from the heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointing. <coughs> Can I get an amen? amen. amen. So we're going to break this down. I want to give you the, the setting of this, this scripture here. Uh, this is actually a prayer. Uh, and it's written by a woman named Hannah. Hannah is most famously known for being the son, um, son, son, the mother of Samuel. Samuel was the greatest judge uh, of Israel at the time. But you ever, you ever get advice from someone that uh, who, who, who says a prayer like this or says something to you? It's like everything's going to be okay. But you look at them and look, they haven't really experienced what you've experienced, like. Like, you know, maybe you have something going on, and they're like, it's okay. God's with you. Like, shut up. You don't know what I'm going through. Are you kidding me? Stop telling me that everything's going to be okay, because guess what? Things aren't okay right now. Things, you don't know, you know, what I've had to go through, the, 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 the road is, I've taken, and, and, and things. You, you don't get it, so please stop. Please, you know, I understand that you're trying to help, but just saying that it's going to be okay uh, is too cliche of an answer for me. That's not gonna gonna really help us. Hannah isn't one of those people. Hannah isn't someone who's, you know, God just given me everything I've ever wanted, so it's okay for me to say this. Hannah actually says this prayer and it's kind of it's kind of uh, comes up out of her and she's a person who's lived her life with a ton of grief, ton of despair, ton of hurt, ton of pain, ton of suffering. And see Hannah's story is pretty rough. Uh, Hannah uh, wasn't able to conceive. She was barren. And if you know anything about in you know, Old Testament times, I mean, women back then, a lot of arranged marriages, I mean, rare, it wasn't like it is now in the 2000s where women uh, just have just as much opportunity as a man. I mean, back then, m- most women, what they did was to be a housemaker. If you couldn't have children, that was pretty uh, dishonorable to a lot of women back then, and, and men would really, well, if you can have children, you can get a new wife that can give me children, and tough luck for you. And so if you can imagine not only being having the, the disappointment of not being able to have children, but now your husband has another wife because you're not good enough for him. I, I, I can't imagine going through that kind of thing. And it must have been pretty, pretty hurtful to her. Not only is she going through this pain, uh, but she's faithful to God. I mean, she she's going to the temple, you know, time after time, and she's praying, God, just bless me, and, and, and God, would you remember me? And still, still no baby, still no baby. And so not only is that happening, but the her rival, which, uh, I forget her name, starts with the end, it's, it's, it's in here, but I wouldn't be able to pronounce it anyway, um, is constantly jeering at her, constantly telling her, you're a failure, you're worthless, kind of like those trolls we talked about a couple weeks ago, pretty much pretty much a troll in her life. And so she's pretty much just completely down. Uh, you can't really come up with a, a story that's much worse than that. I mean, just completely devastated, devastated person. 
But Hannah finally just continues to pray and ask God to remember her, and Hannah does uh, have this baby. So that's the context of this verse and where we're going with it. So in verse 2, it says, and if you guys are following your Bibles, we're going we're to go through this section again. Verse 2, it says, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you, and there's no rock like our God. For someone who's gone all through these kinds of situations, all this hurt, pain, and suffering, she's extremely passionate and enthusiastic. She's starting off counting back all this ridicule, all this time she spent longing for a baby and not having it. And the one thing that underscored everything is that, yes, despite all that, God is in control, and her life is marked by worship and passion, and she never doubts God. She says there's no one holy. She celebrates God's holiness. There's no one beside you. She celebrates God's uniqueness. And there is no rock like our God. She celebrates God's power. And the rock exemplifies over and over again in the Bible just God's strength. And it's undoubtedly, as you look at Hannah, she must have relied on God's strength that whole time to get her through that time. She relied on God through her as a refuge. And so I don't know where you, you, know, you guys are at tonight, and, and, and I could really talking about you know, the things in the, the world that are going crazy and things that are down, but I'm sure specifically many of you guys are going through things in your life, much like Hannah did, that are specific to your situation, whether it's a, a, a loss or a hurt or a rejection or something like that, where you can look at the situation and you can be like, God, really? What, what is going on? Where are you? Are you really in control? Go on to verse 3. It says, Do not boast so proudly or let arrogant words come out of your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge and actions are weighed by Him. And again, undoubtedly, these words were proudly towards Hannah's rival. But I think it's a great reminder for us of really what, how we should act when, when we're viewing God and what's going on in our lives. Because what happens a lot of times, it says right in there, do not be boastful or proud. I think a lot of times when when things aren't going our way, it's easy to say, God, where are you? You're not, you're not sovereign. You're not here. But when things are going good, we're like, yeah. You know, we, we, tend to, we tend to credit, when things are going good, we tend to credit ourselves. Like, I must be pressing in more to God, or I must be doing something right. And so because I'm doing something right, things are good. But as soon as things are bad, we're like, God, what? that's on you. That, that wasn't me. I've been doing the same things. Where are you? I mean, Hannah could have said that. He wasn't rebelling against God, but yet still, her situation wasn't getting any better. This is just, a, just one of those reminders that despite our circumstances, we can never ever think that we're the reason things are going well. God, in God's sovereignty, he's sovereign in the good and the bad. He's still the one that's in control. And so you go down, if you're following along in the Bibles, we've got two, three, we're four through eight. Four through eight are kind of the, one of the coolest parts of this. It's very poetic sounding almost. And you see a bunch of contrast here. I'm going to read it. It says, The bows of the warriors are broken, but the feeble are clothed with strength. Those who are full hire themselves out for food, but those who are starving hunger no more. The woman, is, uh, the woman who is childless gives birth to seven, but the woman with many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and gives life. He sends some to, uh, to Sheol, and he raises others up. The Lord brings poverty and gives wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the garbage pile. He seats them with noblemen and gives them a throne of honor. And see, you see this poetic uh, portion of Hannah's prayer come out. And it's just all these contrasts that just emphasize God's sovereignty. That emphasize that he is in complete control. Making the weak strong, the strong weak. Makes those with plenty bad makes those who starve all of a sudden have way more than they need. It gives the barren woman much, makes the fertile woman deprived. God responsible for life and death. Some are healed and some are not. God gives poverty, gives wealth. He humbles some and he exalts others. And I think that's just, just a reminder that we need to be humble ourselves in, in whatever situation God is in control. And I think this is where this truth comes out is that we can't comprehend the ways of God. When we, as soon as we start to think, God, why did you, why, as soon as we do that, we're already way in over our heads. When we can say, God, why did you do this? Because God is not finite. We are finite beings. We are so limited in our understanding, but yet God knows all. 
And when we, you know, we, we question him, it's just, it's letting ourselves not stand firm in the understanding of he is sovereign. Every time we question him, we have that question, we, we begin to doubt. And if you guys remember last week, I talked about even just the Trinity. I talked about uh, this quote of John Wesley. It says, give me uh, a worm who understands a man, and I will give you a man who understands the triune of God. It's that kind of complexity where you guys need to understand that. It's extremely, for us to question God, I mean, you can't, you, you really can't even start to go there. Hannah ends his prayer uh, like this, uh, 8 through 10. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. He has set the world on them. He guards the steps of the faithful ones, but the wicked are silenced in darkness. For man does not prevail by his own strength. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder in the heavens against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give power to his king. He will lift up the honor of his anointed. And you begin to think about what's going on in our world today. You know, the economy is a mess. Unemployment is way, uh, way up. People are lo losing their homes, businesses remain completely empty as you, you know, drive up and down the streets. And like I said, I don't even begin to go with you individually, what's going on in your person, personal lives. And it, it's easy to look at things and, see, and think that things are spinning out of control, and that God, really? Do you really have this all in control? Because things don't look very good right now. But I want to call the attention to this, this, this first part of verse 8. To the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. He has set the world upon them. In the Old Testament, this, this phrase, foundations of the earth, is seen over and over again, and it just represents God's stability. It's just a reminder that, that God's sovereignty cannot, will not be compromised. And that, yes, He is in control. So there's a couple things I want to talk about, uh, this idea of God's in control and His sovereignty. First is that that doesn't mean just because God's in control that you don't have choices. That doesn't mean that he's a little puppet master and he, he you don't have a choice because you do have a choice. Right right there in the end of that verse, you see, uh, you know, uh, he guards the steps of his faithful ones. The wicked are silenced in darkness. The man does not prevail by his own strength. Your choices will determine how... God acts towards you. So again, I, I want you to, you have choices. It's not like you were, you know, a puppet or anything like that. And the second, I think the more uh, important thing is our perspective. And it, if you don't get anything right, this is one of the things I want you guys to take a note. Your perspective is huge. I mean, you have to come to the realization that God is big and that we are not. And we have to realize that we can't always see the big picture. You can't always see what's going on. You can only see the moment. I mean, you can only see the second. You can't see the second after your next heartbeat. You, you don't know what's going to happen. But yet God is infinite. He knows. And so many times in my life, now that I'm older, and I can look back in my high school days, and I can look back at preparing for college, and there's so many times that I can go, oh, right. That's why at the time, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give some examples in closing, but there are times in my life where I've just been like, God, are you kidding me? This is, this is stupid. I cannot believe this is happening right now, but years down the road, oh, right, now I understand. And so you have to look at everything through that perspective. It's like you can't see what's happening. Else. You don't know where God's leading you. And so the first thing I want you guys to understand is God is in control. The second thing I want you guys to to understand tonight in God's sovereignty is that not only is he in control, and that doesn't mean he's just going to not make sure the world doesn't blow up, and that's it. No, but that means he has a plan. He has a plan. Think of what salvation is. It's a plan. God is a plan. He has provided a way and a plan for people to be redeemed through Jesus to the Father. That's a plan. And I wish... We can see God's plans, or I wish God's plans were probably a little bit more like, like our plans, because many of you, especially some of you guys who are older, might be thinking, you know, I don't know what God's plans for my life is, I don't know why this is happening, I don't know why this situation happened. And if you're like me, uh, you know, when I make a plan, I get some graphs and some 
colored paper and I make some pie charts and I do some research and I get a bunch of data and I talk with my friends and I go to pastor and say this is this is my plan and then I develop action steps and I develop goals and I say in five years this is where I want to be this is how I'm going to do my plan and then I present it and it's got very um, very simple steps to take and, and that's how we would come up with a plan but see God doesn't do that. I don't think I've ever seen God go up to anyone and say, here you go, here's your here's your paper, here's, follow these steps, and this is what's going to happen. That, that would be awesome. That would be spectacular, but that's not the way God works. But the truth is, God does have a plan for each and every one of you. And a lot of times, every one of the situations, even the situations where you don't understand, and you can't see God's sovereignty in it, probably directing you towards that plan. I want to read one last verse to you guys tonight. It's in Isaiah. Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. I'll give you guys a second to turn there. While I take a water break. Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. Questioning God's plan, they were questioning God's sovereignty, and he had to teach them a lesson. 
can you read that part where uh, at the end of verse uh, 11 it says, From the far east I summoned a bird of prey. From a uh, far off hand, a man to fulfill my purpose. That person was Cyrus, uh, king of Persia. See, God was using someone totally unexpected to teach the Israelites. And that happens so often in our life. There's a situation where this isn't good. This is a bad thing. I don't want to listen to that person. But yet, God is going to use that situation to teach us. And Israel had to be thinking in their heads, yeah, God, I know you've been there for us in the past. But seriously, your plan is the worst. Your plan is for us to, to be in exile for 70 years and not to go back to our home. They probably weren't too happy about God's plan. Yet, at the same time, they, they had to trust him. That's what he was telling them. Not, not, oh, it's going to be okay, Israel, but like, you better trust me. I am your dad. I know what's best for you, whether you think I do or not. And I want to share uh, maybe a little bit of my own story to, to help this, relate this to you guys. You know, when I was, uh, a couple, couple things. You know, you know, when I was in high school, I remember uh, I was a decent athlete and I uh, I had plans of playing soccer. Like, that was my plan. Uh, it wasn't God's plan. And I figured, well, that's where I was talented at, and was, that's what I would go do. And I remember uh, shooting hoops right a couple days before I graduated. And I was shooting hoops at a park, and I just, you know, lazy layup, and I fell down, and I broke my foot. And I know I broke my foot. I fell down, and my little brother was there, and my cousin. And I was like, oh! I was like, dang it, I just broke my foot. And they were like, how do you know? I'm like, because I know. They're like, did you just roll it? I'm like, no. I rolled it before, and my foot's broken. I said, this hurts so stinking bad. I, it, be, besides the family, I was just angry because I knew all my plans were screwed up. That was the first thing I thought. I was like, okay, Dad. They're like, why? I'm like, because I can't walk and I need someone to, I was across the street at the park. I said, I need someone to pick me up. You, you can't do it. You're too small. And I was just very, um, a matter of the fact, like, I wasn't even worried. I mean, it, it hurt like crazy, but I was so upset about my plans. And I remember just, just praying to God, like, God, I, why? Why is this happening? This doesn't make any sense. All my plans are screwed up. Down the road, it all started to make sense. Like God's plan wasn't for me to go away and play soccer. If I wouldn't have been home, I wouldn't have gotten involved with Element, wouldn't have had a mentor who mentored me for the past six or seven years. Everything would have been completely different. Another time, um, you know, I, I, there was a girl I really liked, wasn't Julie. And uh, man, I just I was crazy about this girl. And I remember I remember you know just, and putting it to prayer. Like I was I was ready. I'm mean, out. I was gonna go see this girl off her feet. And I was gonna say let's, let's do it. Let's you know let's, the whole nine yards, all that stuff. And uh, I remember praying. I just didn't have a piece about it. And I'm not I, I don't subscribe to that. There's one person for you, or God tells you exactly who to marry. So, uh, that's not my opinion. Uh, but certainly God is gonna approve of who you marry or disapprove. And obviously, he disapproved of this person. And I remember thinking, just being so mad, like, so angry. I, I I'm like, God, there's, there's no way I'm going to have a connection with any other girl like I do this girl. I mean, this, I mean she's my, you know, this girl is my friend. I hung out all the time, but she was it. And I, I would get, I couldn't, I couldn't fathom in that moment, again, I couldn't see past that moment, I couldn't see what was next. I couldn't see. I didn't, couldn't see Julie. I couldn't see a baby. I couldn't see all those things ahead of my future. If I could, I would have been like, no big deal. It'd be easier for me to live uh, trusting God's sovereignty if I could always see the future. And I think a lot of times we want to know what God's plan is for our life. If the band uh, could, could, could come up, we're going to go into worship in just a few minutes. But here's another example, and I hope you guys can understand this. You know, like I, I use that example of how I make plans and how I get it all on paper and I make points and, and that's how we're going to go do it. And I think a lot of times, I think a lot of times God doesn't give us his plans is because if he did, if we really knew what his plan was, we would screw it up really bad. The more we knew about his plan or his plan for our lives, the more we would just try to do it ourselves. And here's an example. You know, God's called me to be to be a pastor, to be a shepherd, to, to teach, to preach his word. And I didn't get that calling until I was 21. And there were times where I sat in situations uh, like you and youth group and 
pastor would you know, talk about a call, and I would pray, and like, God, am I called to the ministry? I feel like maybe I have some of these, maybe I have some of these gifts. Like, that's a possibility. But, I mean, just, I never heard him, you know, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm not copping out, but I never heard God call me to the ministry. Now, down the road, I know that if God would have called me to the ministry in high school, I would have screwed it all up. I'd have been like, okay, here's the plan. I know how to do that. And I would have started walking this way, like, thanks for the plan, God. I'm, I'm going to go take care of it. I would have enrolled in some Bible college, I would, and then I would, I would have just gone after it. But as I look back at my life, I can see the people that God wanted me to be around, the people that God wanted to, to shape me, the people, the plan that God had doesn't always mean revealing every single step of the way. A lot of times, He only gives you as much as you can handle. And that's really the truth of it. And tonight, I'm sure many of you guys have uh, had something in the back of your mind as I've talked about why. We talked about this question of why God does what He does. Why, why God's plan is what it is. And there's a situation in your life, maybe you've never said, God, okay, I trust you. But God, I'm going to give you, you know, my plans. God, maybe, maybe tonight you, you've been all about, you know, you've been all about trying to do stuff for God, but you don't, you haven't even stopped for one second to know what He wants you to do. You just think, I'm going to go do this, and that makes sense, so I'm going to, I'm going to do it. But I want you guys to stand up tonight. The reason I want, I wanted to worship at the end tonight is I want you guys to reflect on God's sovereignty tonight. As we worship, as we sing, I want you guys to be able to reflect on this all-powerful, all-controlling, sovereign God who despite our, our finiteness, despite our inability to understand, despite our inability to grasp why God does what He does, I want you guys to be able to lift your hands and worship Him. Say, God, in my life, these things don't make sense, but I trust you. I know that you are in control. I know you have a plan for my life. 